Major funding for this program was provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, AT&T, and the National Endowment for the Arts. Additional funding was provided by Southwestern Bell Foundation, Texas Council for the Humanities, and the Texas Commission on the Arts. Master accordionist Juan Lopez, one of the last links to a bygone era, celebrates his 75th birthday. Friends and family throughout South Texas gather to pay tribute to a man who for over half a century has played a music that has touched their hearts, a music called Conjunto. At the center of the music is the button accordion, brought to the region by early German settlers over a hundred years ago. One of the last of the Conjunto pioneers, Juan Lopez helped define a unique musical tradition that still exists today. People thought, you know, that accordion music was for um, the old days. They didn't realize, you know, the potentials of the little squeeze, squeeze box. <laughs> Conjunto music, born at the turn of the 20th century, continues to evolve. I remember just just being blown away from just, just the first notes, just right off the bat, and just like, I got sucked in just immediately. Accordion-driven conjunto is uniquely tied to the Mexican-American identity. It's incredible, you know, you hear him play and you just wonder how the hell can he hit that many buttons. It's very danceable, very lively, you know, very alegre, you know, just, you know, you can, you can be down on your luck, you can be on the street, you know, and, or whatever. Somebody cranks on a polka, man, and then, no matter how sad you are, you're going to feel it, you know, the accordion has that. After a while, they come back and teach you. They, they, they're good. I mean, the miles of the kids nowadays are, are, are faster than ours. It just, I don't know where, where it, all of this came from all of a sudden, but the, the young generation just clicked onto it and they love it. You know, they, they, they love what they hear. Somebody make some noise over here! It's, it's this whole combining of different cultures. It's a synthesis, it's a blending. I really think that that blending, that synthesis of music is what makes Conjunto music very distinctive and unique. The Rio Grande Valley of Texas. This region continues to be fertile ground for Conjunto, a music that began here. For Student Activity Week, the group Estilo, the newest generation of Conjunto musicians, has been staging free concerts in area schools. Today, Estilo will bring their version of Conjunto to Mexican-American students who are heavily influenced by mainstream pop music. The leader of the group is Jesse Turner. Basically most of them like rap and like heavy metal and rock. But we kind of mix that funk into funk accordion. You know, we mix different types of music so they can like it. The free concerts have been generating a buzz and the students have elevated Estilo to local celebrity status. We have played for, you know, for several days already. And I'm tired, but I, I, li I, you know, I like the feeling of being up there on stage and performing for these kids.
Traditionally, young Mexican Americans view conjunto as music of their parents' generation. Estilo has successfully bridged the gap between the old and new. It's, it's like he was born with it, basically. Strap that thing on and it's amazing what he can express. You know, you feel el acordeón, you feel this music, you know, and the people do too. When you hear Puro Conjunto played from the heart, then you can, you can immediately identify it as being from the heart. And there's so much today that isn't that way. No matter where you use the accordion, it's got excitement in it. It's got the roots in it that it becomes magic. with grunge and rock influences around him, Albert Zamora burst onto the nightclub scene in the early 90s, infusing a hard-edged style to conjunto. He continues to experiment by finding new ways of playing an old-world instrument. You gotta grab it and, and, you know, make it talk, you know, make, do what you want it. I mean, what you're feeling, you can make it happen. This has been through a bus fire, gotten stolen. Joel Guzman has played the accordion all his life, and early on, knew the accordion had no limits. I don't know, just keep using it. I like it. Got a difference in the volume. Joel Guzman grew up in a musical family and was exposed to conjunto music at an early age. Encouraged by his father, he mastered the button accordion, an instrument that even today is little understood. Before, I think you'd say, you know, geek, you know, geek plays accordions. You know, only geeks play the accordion, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so you always practice in a room and by yourself, don't let nobody know. Um, I can play guitar, you know, I can play bass, I can play drums, I, you know, you name it, I can play it. But I choose to play the accordion. And if uh, that makes me a geek, uh, somebody get me some glasses. <laughs> Born into a dual identity, both Mexican and American, Joel continues to merge both cultures into his accordion style. You're Mexican-American. And that gives us, you know, and we've got different influence here in the U.S. I mean, we got blues influence. Jazz influence, big band, rock, Cajun, bluegrass. I think it's great that you have all these people on the, you know, all these different styles of music, all these different accordionistas. To me, that's the beauty of it all. The first accordions brought to Texas from Germany provided only one row of buttons. A second and third row were eventually added. Today, the three-row button accordion is the main ingredient of conjunto music. Both the Italian Gabanelli and German Honer accordions have cornered the market, a market that had its roots in humble beginnings. When the accordion came into the music, which basically replaced the violin, 
The idea was to really get a bigger sound. That's what they were going for, a bigger sound, louder sound, because you're playing outdoors, and the accordion fit that bill a lot better than the violin did. The accordion was embraced by a people working to carve out a living for their families in a society that many times shunned them. We were all in the same boat. We were all poor. We had to help each other. It was rough, uh, financially and living in poverty. Accordion music is music of the working class. It belongs to the people that work in the fields, that worked in the fields and came home and found this instrument to entertain themselves, you know. So accordion is made for the working people, you know. The early music, without vocals, was played instrumentally and strongly echoed its European roots. They were playing mazurkas, which no one plays anymore. They were playing shottages, which you rarely hear anymore. They were playing some other very German rhythms that you don't hear anymore at all, that are completely gone. The music became conjunto when the bajo sexto, the Mexican 12-string bass guitar, was added. Called El Huracán del Valle for his fast-paced accordion playing, Narciso Martinez is considered the father of conjunto music. With Narciso Martinez, I think more than anybody else, back in the 20s and 30s, he, they added the bajo sexto as accompaniment. So then Narciso focused on just the melody, and the bajo was the accompaniment. We developed our own distinctive style. Dances were held outside in the street, you know, I mean, right by the street, so people would gather, not inside any building, but outside. The dancing was done right there, all the dancing. Uh, and the, the, the stage was, I guess, right over there, that area over there was the stage. It was an outdoor fiesta every Saturday night, La Polquita, where Mr. Camilo Cantu, El Azote de Austin, was playing every Saturday night. And every Saturday, my mom and dad would go there, and I'd go there and get close to the musicians, and oh my gosh, I liked them polkas, the way Mr. Camilo played them. My parents were dancers, you know, that, that was their... That was their life. That was, that's all they, they did for entertainment because we worked six, six days a week. And the seventh day was dancing time. It was great because the, fa the, the father and the mother would bring their daughters and they would come in and sit down. And all the cars used to park facing the, facing the, the patio. So a lot of the people stayed in their cars and watched the people dance. Eventually, the outdoor dances moved inside, and dance halls became the main source of entertainment. By adding drums and electric bass, Tony de la Rosa created a new dance sound that became distinctly Texas-Mexican. In the 30s and 40s, the music was mostly uh, instrumental. It was very rapid, you know, the beat, the rhythm. And uh, Tony took it and slowed it down. Gave it a whole new aspect, you know, Tacuachito, the style of dance came out, you know, and a little bit slower dance, very easy to dance to, a very nice compas, the pace, you know. People embrace that, they like that. When you hear certain songs, there's a certain style of song. It's just very... Um, it's, it's gripping, and you remember how music just, you know, alegra el corazón. As the music continued to grow, conjunto musicians refined the dance hall sound. Ruben Vela began incorporating a Mexican song tradition called ranchera and popularized an irresistible dance beat.
Iba a los bailes nomás a ver la gente tocar, los músicos, ¿verdad? Y siempre me gustó. He epitomizes the dance hall sound. The very sort of pesado, you know, very hardcore um, ranchera sound made for dancing. In urban areas, a more vibrant and polished conjunto style was emerging. Valerio Longoria was at the forefront of the new sound. He is a great innovator within the tradition. Uh, developed a totally distinctive style. He's credited with doing so many innovative things within the genre, like being one of the first ones to stand up and play. You know, basically put straps on the accordion because before that, they didn't have straps. Uh, uh, and everybody played sitting down. Uh, one of the first to sing and play because before, you know, Valerio, it was all instrumental music. He's credited with introducing the bolero. The boleros were a different thing. The boleros were romantic songs. The boleros were considered more of a, a high class kind of um, vocal tradition. It was very popular in Mexico, um, heard on the radio. Valerio, he has this beautiful, sweet voice very romantic and I think people were just really taken by it. Flaco Jimenez followed in the footsteps of his father, the legendary Santiago Jimenez, to create a unique Tex-Mex accordion sound that cuts through all genres. Flaco has added those influences like country and, and rock and blues and Cajun Zydeco that have given him more of, a, of an appeal, I think, to a broader audience. He's very well known, probably the, the best known conjunto artist in the world. play for 48 hours straight and not play the same song over, you know. Physically, you can do it. Many people know Flaco Jimenez because he's pers he has decided to take the kernel of his music and present it to a larger audience outside of his own community. With towns called Fredericksburg, Grun, and New Braunfels, Central Texas is part of the German Belt. Germans were the first to bring the button accordion to Texas and northern Mexico. German immigrants, the largest European ethnic group in Texas, settled here in the mid-1800s and made contact with Texas Mexicans. 
Along with their language and culture, Germans brought their musical traditions. Baron Schlamois grew up in New Braunfels and is chairman of Conservation Plaza, a restored German village. This is an accordion probably dating from around 1920. Another bass. Though the communities were apart, Texas Mexicans liked the sound of the early button accordion, heard it dances throughout the German settlements. Flock of a Menace is probably the strongest evidence of that. He was a child in the 1940s and tells of how his father would bring him to New Braunfels to listen to the German polka bands. Texas Mexicans also responded to the German polka and slowly began incorporating the lively steps into their own dance styles. The polka, I think, kind of worldwide was a rhythm that was really becoming, you know, especially around the turn of the century, that had made its way down from the upper class, the bourgeois class, down to sort of, you know, the everyday common class of people all around the world. German polka style music that we now have, in my opinion, came from Poland and from Czechoslovakia, from the Slovakian culture, because they're next door to Germany. And they're the people who like that fast, that fast uh, beat and that strong beat of the German polka. Oompa, oompa, oompa. And that's, I think it's Slavic actually in origin. And then the Germans decided it was great fun and just made it their own. Pearly Sal is a descendant of a German family that helped settle the region. My father's family came from the uh, northern part of Germany, around Hanover, and my mother's family came more Bavarian to the southern part. Pearlie has played the German belt for over 20 years and tries to maintain the musical traditions passed down to her by her uncle. In the evening when the work was done out on the ranch, we'd go into the parlor and he'd get out that knutch and he and I would sit there and he'd play and he'd show me how to do that and then we'd, he'd teach me these songs. At one time, Germans were the majority population here. Through the years, their numbers have dwindled. By my own childhood in the 1940s, the German presence was probably still about 60%. Today, I'd say 10%. Usually of retirement age and older, visiting winter Texans from northern states, where polka dancing remains popular, make up the bulk of the crowd at the local German dances. These are songs that they had learned as a, in their youth. So they request them, and there, it surprises them when uh, I can play some of these songs. The traditional music is quickly fading, and for the people of the German belt, the accordion is not the central instrument that it once was. Every other teenager in town took accordion lessons. Uh, it was the social thing to do. Um, you take accordion lessons, and it took teachers, full-time teachers, to give all these lessons. Today, there's not an accordion teacher to be found. folks are just disappearing and the younger folks are going a different direction so uh, uh, it's being lost. In the 30s, 40s and 50s, accordions all over the country. Everybody played all over. But no more. Eddie Chavez fondly remembers the golden age of the accordion 
from the 30s and 40s, a time when great Italian accordionists such as Charles Magnante and Pietro Diero mastered the piano accordion. The piano accordion was actually started in San Francisco by Pietro Diero, Guido Diero, back in the early 20s, the first time they thought of putting piano keys on it. Though the piano accordion became more recognized in America and the rest of the world, Conjunto musicians remained loyal to the sound of the button accordion. The piano accordion is based on a chromatic scale. You get these sharps and your flats. This one is based on a diatonic scale, no sharps or no flats. And again, you get a, it's a push-pull system. Two notes and one button. The diatonic accordion is a wind instrument and works like a harmonica. To get a distinctive sound, conjunto musicians removed the bass chords. Modern conjunto Mexican players do not play the bass. The next time you see a conjunto, you'll notice their left hand. It's totally idle. All it's doing is pushing and pulling. The Mexican conjunto guys produce only melody with the right hand, and that's it. What they're working is an, that air button to get that real power into them. That's where this sound comes from that is so exciting with their music. It's just something that feels right. You know, you can play the same piece with the piano accordion and the same piece with a button accordion, and it's going to be night and day. The chromatic accordion, hugely popular around the world, works similar to the piano accordion, except with buttons. Because of its cost and size, it too was rejected and is rarely played by conjunto musicians. One exception was Paulino Bernal, who with his chromatic accordion ushered in a new era and would become one of the most influential conjunto musicians in history. It's been a long time. <laughs> In the 1960s, Paulino Bernal and his brother Eloy stunned audiences with a style of accordion music never heard before. By pairing Paulino's chromatic accordion with that of the legendary Oscar Hernandez, they created a sound that mesmerized Mexican-American audiences throughout the country. The guy was just light years ahead in his playing. Real serious music with all these harmonies. And then that, that kind of bled into his polka style and it was real smooth it's it wasn't considered your your down home uh, stopping polkas of today you know even though the piano and the chromatic are the preferred accordions throughout the rest of the world the diatonic button accordion remains the instrument of choice for conjunto musicians The polka, too, has evolved quite differently from its German beginnings. Theories for the differences abound. We took the polka and we slowed it down and we, we shuffle our feet instead of picking up our feet a whole lot because of temperature. It's a lot easier for us to shuffle our feet when it's hot down here and we're used to hot weather. Whereas in the northern countries, like Germany and the Scandinavian countries, there's a, you can do all much more movement and, uh, and not have to worry about exhaustion. And we apply that to, to polkas. <laughs> okay, we're conjunto now. You're a umpa, you know. You stay over there, we'll stay over here. We have our music you know, that we use the button accordion, that we got from them, and that we created something, you know, distinctive from them, but still using their instrument. It's interesting how 
We may come from the same sort of root, but yet are very different. If it wasn't for the conjunta music, you turn on the radio and that's the only accordion music you can hear. They're the ones that keep it alive. As Conjunta became the focus of cultural and social expression, the demand created opportunities for musicians to earn a living. It was rough going to school and coming home and, and helping with chores and then going to the bars at night and trying to earn money and help the family. You know, the cantina was right across the street from where we grew up, you know. Uh, it, it was not a stigma of a bad place. You know, we ne we never, I never considered it uh, a bad place. As a matter of fact, that was my entertainment, you know. I could hear the jukebox from my house, and I knew what song they were playing. Oh, they're playing C5, you know, because we knew it, you know. It, it was not a, a bad place, you know. And my mother, you know, I don't know if she was, if she liked it or, or not like it, but... You know, she understood that as long as we, if we were with my father, we were going to be okay. So we were always together, and music brought the family together. We used to play for like uh, five dollars a night for everybody. That was a lot of money for one of them, ten dollar a night, kilowatt. Then went up to two dollars, then three dollars. Major American record labels like RCA and Bluebird were recording conjunto music in the late 20s and 30s. World War II put a stop to all recordings, and the major labels pulled out. We had uh, a jukebox route, and we couldn't find any records because during the war, everything was at standstill. And so my husband had to go to Mexico to get the recordings. It is said that Armando Marroquin was the first Mexican-American to produce a conjunto record in the United States. We recorded a song by the name uh, Se Me Fue Mi Amor, Se Me Fue La Guerra. Y no sé cuándo volverá. Y lo quisiera poder volar a donde está mi amor. Y lo quisiera volar a donde está mi amor. The Marroquines, with Carmen and Laura as their top seller, founded the Ideal Record Company in Alice, Texas, and an industry was born. Times are slow, and you know, but regardless of the fact, you know, cars maybe didn't run that fast, but news traveled pretty fast, you know, so it was pretty evident that they knew what Armando Marroquín was doing. At about the same time, Falcón Records, who would later become a major player in conjunto music, began in a living room in Mission, Texas. For the recording purposes back then, I remember there was a, uh, it looks like a record player, but it was an acetato recorder. And what it is is that, uh, Instead of using tape, the only means of recording back then was, was like a disc, a record. Before the recordings would start, either my uncle or myself would go out to the street to see if any cars would be coming by, and we would holler to my father, it's clear, and then the, he would signal to the band, and the band would start recording. One mistake on that acetate, I'd start all over again, put a new acetate, go back out in the street and give the signal, everything's clear. Following its success in radio came something even bigger for Falcon. Television. Fanfaria Falcon. De regreso al programa. Aquí está el éxito del año. Through the power of television, Arnaldo Ramirez, founder of Falcon Records, propelled conjunto music beyond the Texas border with syndicated programming that reached new audiences. He had his program, Fanfaria Falcon, syndicated in uh, 244 cities in the United States and eventually got picked up for many years into Mexico and Central America. As advertisers realized the market potential, competition heated up and more television programs were in demand. Sunday morning it was one half hour show after another and mostly all conjunto. Those Sunday morning programs were feeding us conjunto music all the time. We were usually getting ready for mass and starving because we couldn't eat 
before communion, <laughs> anticipating the barbacoa that came later after communion. But, um, but th all the time we were getting ready for, for mass, that music would be on. So we'd go from the conjunto to the mass, from the mass to the barbacoa. <laughs> In the 1970s, Roberto Pulido y los Clásicos broke new ground by combining a brass sound with the accordion. He would later become an institution, but in the early years, his performance style and tenor voice caught audiences by surprise. It was a guacamole, you know, like high-pitched accordion, saxophones, and then I added a 12-string with like, you know, but... For the very first four years that we recorded, not even my mom bought a record. You know, we were literally speaking, I mean, we were starving, but, well, we were doing it uh, because it, it goes in your heart. You're born with it. The music. By the 1980s, Conjunto was losing out to American pop music. Musicians looked for new ways to reach young audiences. We'd get material and they would tailor it. We'd have some clothes tailored for us and have glittery shirts or shiny material or it looked like a tablecloth or, <laughs> you know, and, and, and we look at it today, you know, today we, we laugh like, ah, oh, we dressed like this, huh? Brady Bunch or something, you know. Los Chamacos, which means the kids, started a trend that would later prove effective in bringing the younger generation to Conjunto. We started thinking of using rock intros of the beginning of a song. And that's what got a lot of kids' attention. Like, wow, what? Like a rock beat, an accordion, dun, 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 dun. just doing little things with the accordion, but in a rock beat, and then jump into the ranchera. And the kids would get amazed, and they were really liking that. And we thought, that's the click right there. That's what's going to grab the young generation. That's what's going to get them focused on what we're doing. <laughs> a new look, a new way of playing the accordion. Jaime de Anda y los Chamacos set the standard for a new generation of conjunto musicians. Young audiences have a deep connection to Conjunto, even though many of them don't speak Spanish. Like many Mexican-Americans growing up in the United States, Jaime de Anda came face to face with his own dual culture. My dad used to have a singer, he would sing for it because I couldn't, I couldn't speak Spanish. We spoke nothing but English at the house. So one day my dad got, came home and he says, no, that's it, this guy's not lasting, he's not going to work, and we look for another singer player, he doesn't work, he doesn't last, and you guys are going to have to start singing, he pointed at me and my cousin. What? You guys are going to have to start singing. I said, but Dad, we don't even speak Spanish. So I started listening to the records and started trying to say words, and, and you could tell it was English, Spanish. <laughs> and before you know it, you start speaking. They're growing up, the kids, they're starting to listen to these pioneers. And they're getting into it. They're listening to it and they're buying some of their cassettes now and saying, wow, so this is where it came from. So this is where that song came from. So this is the original tune. All I listened to was rap. I mean, hardcore rap and old school. Like, um, I was around my sister a lot, and her husband is like that lowrider type, you know, always has lowriders and stuff, so that's what I was into. But I don't pay attention to it anymore. It's like I can put my radio on B104, and it's like, it doesn't do anything for me. I put on a Conjunto CD, and it's like, wow, there it is. Every time I listen to it, it could be the same song. 
every time I listen to it, it just shocks me because I just find it, I don't know why, I just find it so fulfilling. Cecilia Sines hopes to follow in the footsteps of her late grandfather, a gifted accordionist. The music she likes is traditional, conjunto music. My dad would sit right here where, you, where we are and play the accordion until, until it was 10, 11, 12 o'clock at night until my mother said, Ya cállate con esa cosa y métete para adentro. He was really into the accordion, into the accordion music, and always uh, wished, I guess, that one of us or some of us would uh, would learn and pick up the accordion. And I think Sissy, you know, picked up part of it. I don't know anything in minor. He's really the one that I'm playing for. I just, I know he's listening, and I know he's proud of me because he loved accordion. Cecilia has begun to venture out. She has been invited to play at the annual Conjunto Stampede in San Antonio. The first time I played accordion in front of people, I thought my fingers were going to fall off. And there was a lot of people there, and oh man, I got up there and I thought I was going to faint. I really honestly thought my fingers were going to fall off. They just went crazy. And I don't know how I finished. <laughs> I didn't even remember. <laughs> All she has to do is go to a dance and play, and people stand around her, you know, and they love it. They love to see a young, a young woman, you know, and, and you can see it in her face when she's playing that she just, she loves to play. Today, a young woman playing the accordion is applauded. But it wasn't always that way. Historically, it was just not an instrument that uh, a woman was supposed to play on the one hand. On the other hand, and probably even more important, was that music was just not uh, um, an occupation for women. People thought, you know, that accordion music was for um, low-class people. That's what they thought. The accordion specifically had its role still in the cantinas. It was still very much felt that way. You wouldn't find women playing instruments in the band. It wasn't considered proper because, again, the sort of cantina roots that uh, Conjunto has, to have a woman playing an instrument, um, this just, I think, was unheard of. Eva Ibarra was the exception. A self-taught musician, Eva Ibarra began playing at ice houses, restaurants, and dance halls when she was six years old. Today, Eva remains one of the genre's most prolific accordionists. I'm really truly amazed that she continued in spite of everything that she had to endure. Her father was very unique and must have been a very strong man. I met him a couple of years before he died. And to, to really put up with, um, he, you know, he said that neighbors, relatives, everyone were telling him, you shouldn't, you, what are you doing letting her play the accordion? That is, you know, that just shouldn't be happening. I mean, she could have chosen another instrument, but, you know, the accordion of all things. 
she's going to go down in history as as someone that uh, really put women out there and, and, and as the best female accordionist uh, ever. totally different era and a new generation and the music is changing. It's changing a lot and Sissy I hope will have something to do with it. What we have here today is El Conjunto, El Conjunto Regional. It is very happy music. At Ed Couch Elsa High School, Benny Layton teaches one of the only classes found in America that includes Conjunto as part of its music curriculum. Conjunto music has not always been accepted, you know, in true society. Uh, but uh, we have it at Ed Couch Elsa High School, and w we, we felt, uh, the administration felt that it was important that we provide a venue uh, uh, through the performing arts, you know, for Conjunto Music. One of the first assignments that they get when they come into my class is, uh, I want you to go home and I want you to talk to the elder member of your household, whether it be your, your father, your mother, your grandfather, your tío, whoever it may be, the elder member of your family, and I want you to ask them what are some of the songs that they listened to when they were kids. And we start playing them. And so we build this bond between, between the, the students and, and the family, the elder members of the family, and, and this connection helps them uh, as, as students uh, of, of music and in life in general, you know, to understand who they are and where they are coming from. As long as there's that new breed of person coming up that can play the accordion and can express himself in his own way, su estilo, that's the better. That's just going to continue the music. Like in the past, independent record labels are still a major force in Conjunto music. Thank you for calling Hacienda. How can I help you? Having to compete with large record labels that have more money and clout, independents have to work overtime to survive. It is through these small independent labels that the regional Conjunto music is kept alive and distributed worldwide. Hacienda Records is on a constant search for new talent. Their latest find is 14-year-old Victoria Galvan. It was hard at the beginning, but now it's easy. It's, and my mom asked me, how do, you, how do you memorize all those buttons? How do you know what to push? I'm like, I don't know. I just push it, you know? I just, I guess I memorize it in my head, or I don't know what. Just comes to me. The accordion probably weighs as much as she does. <laughs> She's a small little petite thing and then you see her just get on the accordion and people just they don't believe it. Victoria has recorded her first single. Hacienda Records has scheduled performances, radio tours, and personal appearances as part of the plan to launch her career. We expect a lot of good things from her. Well, like I said, we've taken her a couple of places. She's been a couple of places, and she gets a really big response. Paul and Nelda Galvan, Victoria's parents, recognized early on her talent for music. The first lesson was just actually here in this living room, and uh, she learned the scales. You gotta have that thing that, to play. You can't just say, well, 
I'm going to play the accordion and it's going to happen because she has to have had it for her to do that. Because she can pick up a song in 15 minutes, you know. Even the pom pom pom. What I like to do is I like to mix my English stuff that I do with my Spanish stuff and combine it together to make it very commercial to a commercial ear for young people, you know, who, who are interested in ballads, who are interested in, you know, life itself, love, growing up, and all that other good stuff. And you just put that into music and add a little bit of accordion to it, to it and it just, you know, it, it feels young. Especially when Victoria's playing, you know, I, it just catches my eye how she does that, you know. It's good stuff. It's good music. It's good music. Young you are. Tell everybody how old you are. I'm 14 years old. Okay, it's called Carta de Amor right here on KQQQ La Nueva with Victoria off of Hacienda Records. And you're playing the accordion, right? Yes. Excellent. She's been doing very well. She was real, she was a little nervous at first, but then, you know, I guess she got more comfortable with it. Um, right now, she goes back to school in a couple of weeks. So we're trying to get this in before she goes back to school. And then we'll see how we work around her school schedule. She's year-round school, so she gets a break every six to eight weeks. So we're going to see how we're going to work that out to do more radio tours with her. Yes, so thank you so much, Mia. Thank you. Congratulations and good luck. Bye-bye. For Victoria, this time in her life marks not only her professional debut, but also a personal one. She will soon turn 15 and will celebrate with a traditional Mexican party called a quinceañera. It means a lot to me. I've been waiting all my life for this. Since I was eight, I don't even know. I've been telling them, oh, I'm going to have a quinceañera and I want a quinceañera. And I just, I'm really looking forward to it because I've been to quinceañeras and the girls have fun and they have their friends with them standing up. I'm looking forward to have a good time. All these young kids now, that that's what they listen to, Spanish, and they're the ones, all the musicians you see out there, they're very young, and they're getting younger. <laughs> Victoria is part of the new generation that, in their own way, will continue the accordion tradition. No, accordion will never die. The, the accordion is going to be here forever. You know, my sons and their sons or their daughters or, will be dancing to accordion music. And through this next century, I can pretty much guarantee that. Jesse Turner is now 21. His time spent performing free concerts has paid off. He has just signed a recording contract with an independent record label. There's no end to learning in the accordion. There's always going to be a lot more. It's something that can make your dreams come true. It's making mine. <laughs> Music is just an expression. It serves as a, as a musical mirror to the people. And whatever the people dictate, whatever the people are living and listening to, our music, Conjunto Music, is going to be playing for them. You know, I can always count on my accordion to make me happy. And when I'm happy, it's like, wow, vamos a tocar algo, pues ando alegre, ¿verdad? Let's celebrate, let's play. It's always there. <laughs> Thank you.
Visit PBS online to find out more about yesterday's and today's accordion trailblazers at pbs.org. Major funding for this program was provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, AT&T, and the National Endowment for the Arts. Additional funding was provided by Southwestern Bell Foundation, Texas Council for the Humanities, and the Texas Commission on the Arts.